In this video, I'm gonna show you everything that you need to know how to safely replace your garage door springs. Not only that, we're gonna focus on safety, of course, but we're also gonna show you how you can save so much money doing this if you're willing to put in the time to learn how to do it, which is really gonna be covered entirely in this video. And then, in my case, I'm saving about $330 from having to call a technician. Now, I had two friends recently who had their garage door springs break. They're both in the local area here. I live in Utah and each of them called different techs and had them replace only the springs. Nothing else, they didn't do drums or tracks or anything like that, just the springs. Each of them paid $450. I did the research and figured this out and my total cost out the door, including shipping, taxes, everything was about $120. So that $330 savings, I wanna pass on to you so that you can do this, but if you're not willing to slow down and do this right, don't do it. Safety is your main priority here. There's a lot of pressure going on. There's a lot of tension on these springs. And I've heard some horror stories of a couple of things, really terrible things happening with injuries and things like that. Teeth being knocked out, all that kind of stuff. So take it seriously, take it slow. If you follow everything that we're showing in this video, you should be in good shape to be able to replace this yourself and save hundreds of dollars in the process. I've broken the video down into four separate steps. The first one that gets skipped so many times in videos and articles is, how to find the right springs that you're going to replace yours with. Now I've got two scenarios we're covering here. In my case, I'm using both scenarios. The first is that you've got a broken spring like this one up here. So if that happens, then a lot of times you can just replace it with the same set or you can upgrade it to one with a higher cycle count, which is basically a longer lifespan. Or in the second scenario, if you've added weight to your door, like I have here with this insulation, then that's going to require you to upgrade your springs as well. Now I've got both scenarios going on, so I've researched and found the new springs that I need and there are some amazing tools out there that I'm gonna point you to that will help you with that. So that's the first thing. Second is how to safely remove your old springs. There's several steps we're gonna follow and if you go with me on this, you're gonna do just fine. Third, we're gonna put the new springs on and bring them up to tension. We're gonna show you how to use the winding bars to get those just to the right place and then get your door properly balanced. And then fourth and final, we're gonna actually cover a little bit about maintenance and making sure that you only have to watch this video once. That's my goal, I want you in and out and done with all of this after one viewing basically, or after following along the steps once. So I'm gonna show you exactly what you need for maintenance on that, what to check, what to look out for, and how to make sure your door stays balanced long term. If you're ready for all that and you're willing to take the time to do this safely and do it right, Let's go for it. In order to get the right new springs for your garage door, we need to identify a few different things. And even if you already know some of this, you wanna make sure to try to get all of this information just because you wanna get this absolutely right. Last thing you wanna do is get the wrong springs for your door and then have to send them back and go through that whole process after you've installed them. Not a good situation. So there's three things that we need to know about the garage door and track. And then there are four things we need to know about the springs. So for the door, the first thing we need to know is how tall it is. Usually it's gonna be seven or eight feet. Next, we need to know what the track radius is. And that's almost always gonna be 12 or 15 inches. And then thirdly, we're gonna to need to know how heavy the door is. And I'm gonna show you how to find that out using some scales. Now for the spring itself, there are four things that we need there as well. First, we need to know the total length of the spring when it's compressed. We also need to know the inside diameter. We also need to know what the wire thickness is. It's called the spring size. Lastly, for the spring, we need to understand the wind direction. Now this is important in some ways for the install, but it's not necessarily important that you figure out which one is broken, for example. We'll get more into that in just a little bit. So let's start by showing you how to identify each of these. For the garage door height, it's really just a matter of measuring it. Typically it's gonna be seven foot or eight foot, and just get your measuring tape out. Keep in mind, it's not gonna be an exact measurement, so mine's not likely gonna be eight feet directly. If you look at the very top of it, it is about eight feet, but a lot of times you can't see past the support bar on top here. So mine is an eight footer, which really runs to about 94 inches on that header. Yours is likely gonna be seven or eight in most cases, so figure out your door height. From there, we need to figure out what our track radius is. The track radius is the radius of this curve right here. And to find that, I've got a measuring tape that has a magnetic end, which is pretty handy. That's just fastened to the bottom of the track on top. Then we're gonna use a level, put the top of it aligned with the joint at the bottom of the radius, try to get it level, which in my case is right about there, and then find out what that measurement looks like at the top of the level. Now in my case, level might not actually be what we want because we may wanna go with the curvature of the actual garage floor, which is what this one parallels. But either way, you can see the top of the level is at about 12 inches. 
11 to 12. The opposite would be if we had a 15 inch radius down here. So whichever it's closest to 12 or 15, that's the number. Now this is where we're gonna introduce two super important safety features. The first one, you need to wear safety glasses the entire time you're working on anything with the springs, the door, anything like that where something could come loose. It's just a good idea to be smart about that. The second, and I think maybe the most important safety thing of this entire process is knowing how to stay away from this zone right here. So right here, this is called the winding cone on the end of the spring. This spring is live and active. I'm gonna try my best not to touch this or interact with it too much any more than I have to. Most importantly, if anything on the winding cone comes loose, especially these little red square headed keys right here, they're just mounting screws essentially. If those come loose, this whole thing will come flying with tons of pressure and tons of force and speed. We wanna be clear of that. Those can be very dangerous and the winding bars could go flying, all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna keep my body and my head out of this zone right here. I'm just gonna stay away from it. I'm gonna stay on one side of it the entire time I'm working and that will keep me safe. In order to get the weight of your garage door, go the simplest way you can. Try to work smarter, not harder on this one. If there are labels on your garage door that tell you maybe a manufacturer and a model number, just punch that in online and see if it will provide the weight for you. Look for any easy ways to do this so that you don't have to actually weigh this out manually, but in a lot of cases, you're not gonna have a choice. So I've got insulation on here, everything's covered, and the insulation adds its own weight, so I wanna get it accurate. So what I'm gonna do is use a couple of these analog scales. I'm using two in this case because this is a 16-foot garage door for a two-car garage door. If you have a one-car garage door, then you could probably get away with just one. Now these were 15 bucks each at Walmart. They have a 300-pound weight limit. So I figured I would use these in future videos, so I wanted to just purchase these. If you don't have one of these or have access to one, you probably don't need to purchase one. Maybe just ask your grandma. She probably has one of these analog scales. The reason we're using analog, not digital, is because digital ones have a very small window of just a few seconds in which they gather the weight. And we need more than that because we're gonna be using these several times and we need to be able to just have an, a real-time rating of what that weight is. Now this often will require two people in order to do this right because one of you is gonna be up on the ladder lifting up the garage door. Now, in order to do that, this is where your winding bars come in. I can't emphasize to you enough do not skimp, do not try to take a shortcut on this, get actual winding bars. They don't cost much, they're 15 or 20 bucks for a set, and these are what you really need to do any of this job. You cannot use rebar, you cannot use screwdrivers, you cannot use some bar that you've got hanging around that looks good enough. Get winding bars. This is a true safety issue in this case. Now these particular ones have these little rubber markers on them and that will help us to know exactly one inch depth down from the end and that helps us to make sure that they're properly seated while using them. If you don't have these little markers on them, use some electrical tape and make that marking yourself one inch from either end. Now, speaking of safety, we're gonna do two things at this point that apply for the rest of the process here. The first one, disengage your garage door from the motor carriage. So you wanna pull on that string there, that little emergency pull string, and make sure that's disengaged so that your garage door is not attached to the motor assembly. Number two, we wanna shut off all the power to your motor altogether. So make sure to just unplug it. Don't try to just disable it with a button or anything. Just unplug it, pull the plug on that, and you're good to go. In addition to the two scales, you're also gonna need some lengths of two by four. I recommend you get some that are at least about three feet long, and two by fours are pretty cheap, so go buy one if you need to, but you've probably got some scraps laying around that will do the job. We're gonna lift the door up just a little bit using our winding bar. We're gonna pop the scales in on either side, and then we're gonna take the readings, and this is where that second person is gonna be able to help you out here. So I'm gonna use my two winding bars that we showed earlier. I've got my daughter here helping me out with the scales. I'm gonna start out by lifting the garage door using the winding bars here. So I'm gonna put one of these in up here. Again, kind of staying off to the side. And as I pull on it, pull down, it's gonna lift up the garage door. And I've got it seated firmly in there. That's why those little black marks are so helpful. I can see that it's seated all the way down to the black mark. I'll put my next one in. Now I've got the garage door lifted enough that we can put the scales underneath. So she's putting these scales in for me right underneath the door. Now as I lower this and put the weight. Now, by the way, I've got the scales zeroed out already, so there's no issues there. So I've got it zeroed with the weight on top. And then as I put this on here, it's gonna read one thing, but the first thing I need to do is make sure that there's no settling that needs to take place. So I'm gonna give the door a good shake. All right, and then Ani, if you'll read the scales now, this is kind of the before, but because I have one broken spring, I'm actually going to need to adjust it and put a little more pressure on there by turning the shaft 45 degrees out of the 360, so about one-eighth turn to make sure I see what those are. What is it measuring right now? So 50 and 85. 
There we go. What I'm doing is I'm trying to cause a little slack in the cables. I'm watching my cables. They're loose. Let's get another reading on them. 103.95. So we're just shy of 200 pounds total for our garage door weight on this particular one. Now we've got that weight. I'm going to lift these up again so that we can take those scales out and we're good. If you would. Thank you. Very carefully let that one down. And we're done. Now for the four bits of information we need for the spring itself, these are actually pretty easy to find in many cases, but I'm gonna show you both ways to find them. I actually pulled this label off of the left spring, the one that was sitting on the left side of the center bar, and this one has everything that I need right on it, which is fantastic. Sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll have all of this. So right up here you can see it says RW, which means right wound, and that means it's the one that's on the left side of the center as you're facing the inside of the garage, or as you're standing inside the garage. It also, it says 0.192. So that refers to the wire size or the spring size here. That's how big each one of these is. And then the two here refers to the inside diameter of the spring, which is another bit of information we need. And then 18.5, that's the length of the spring. So I got all of that information just off this label, makes it really easy. Sometimes you'll just have a part number like this one, 7000154. If you Google that and put it in garage spring or torsion spring, a lot of times you'll find all of this same information when you pull up the page result with that part number. So that can be really helpful as well. Now, assuming you don't have that, you can still find all of the information you need for this. To start out with the spring length, this is just what you think it is. It's just measuring the entire spring. Now it's key here that when you do this, the spring has no break in it and that it's not under tension. So here you can see this is this replacement spring that I'm using is a 36 inch spring. And so we can see that pretty easily. If you've got a broken spring, then you can actually loosen one end of it with the winding cone and then put it together with the other end that's broken and get that measurement that way. That's probably the easiest and best way to get your length just from a broken spring. You can see on this new one, it says 234 printed right on here. And that's the key to the next step. You can actually just look and see if there's some information printed right on here. This one only says 234, but my other model, the old one that broke, has a lot more information than that printed on it. So be sure to look for clues on that one, especially if you have a broken spring. If they're under tension, you're not gonna be able to read anything. This is all gonna be twisted and mangled up, so that's not gonna help. So it really only helps once they're loosened or broken. When it comes to finding out your wire size, the way you do that is you count 20 of these coils here. So to give you an example of that, if we take, for example, see if I go, I'll go above the two, three, four here. I'll start where that two is. So if I start right there and say one, two, three, four, five, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, to the 20, I can see that I'm at four and three quarters roughly. So I need to divide that four and three quarters by 20 and then I'll get my wire size. And that's the easiest and most accurate way to get your wire size on these. You can do it by 10, you can do it by 20. You can also measure in different parts of it just to make sure. And again, this requires the spring not be under tension. So as I do the math here, 4.75 divided by 20 equals 0.2375. And that's actually within a few thousandths of the exact measurement of this, which is 0.234 that these are. So you know that came out pretty close, which is pretty great. So we can round up to that nearest number to find out exactly what that is, but that gives us a pretty accurate measurement of our wire size. One thing to always check is for stamps or marks on your springs. Now, obviously this is a new spring, so everything's clean and easy to read, but typically these are still very much legible, even on an older spring that's a little bit dirty if you give it a little wipe around this winding cone on the end here. And you'll notice on here it says P200S, and then I believe that's a six there. And basically that lets us know that the 200 refers to the inside diameter of the spring. So that's an easy way to get your inside diameter. That's saying it's a two inch inside diameter. You'll usually have some sort of marking and then I'll put a link in the description to a site that has a chart with all of the different stamps that you might find on the winding cones that will help you interpret what that inside diameter is. And sometimes they'll have other information on there as well. But typically the inside diameter is gonna be consistent because this winding cone can only be a two inch inside diameter. The last thing we need to know is left wind versus right wind, and there's a really simple way to tell on this one. When you're standing inside your garage, as long as the springs are in the right place, then the one on the left is actually a right wind. Makes perfect sense, right? 
and the one on the right is the left wind. Now again, check labels first. Maybe you'll find that printed on here or find some easy way to tell. If not, there's a little trick to looking at this. If you've got a broken spring like this one, I can see that there's the end of it right here, or I can see this end right here. Doesn't matter, it's gonna read the same no matter what it is. And you can just use your hands to remember which is which. So if I use my right hand here, you can see that my index finger is going counterclockwise. So if that's the way your spring looks when you look at the end of it, that means it's your right hand, so it's a right wind. Opposite on your left hand, there's a left wind and it's going clockwise, and that's for a left wind spring. Now the only reason that might matter is if you have two new springs and one of the new springs breaks, gets lost, damaged, something like that. In almost every case, you're gonna to wanna to replace both springs. And again, the only time you're not gonna do that is if you know that both springs, like the other one that's there that's still good, is new. Then you can just replace the one that needs to be replaced and the other one's probably gonna be fine. If both your springs are a little bit older and one breaks, it's likely that the other one's gonna break not long after, so just replace them both. Now that you're armed with all the information about your springs, keep your safety glasses on because the internet can be a dangerous place and we're gonna hop over to a website. Now again, no sponsors here whatsoever. This is just a tool that I found super helpful and this whole entire website is really helpful. This is called ddmgaragedoors.com. It's founded by a guy named Dan Music and he's got tons of great information on here. So I'll put the links in the description. Be sure to check that out here. This is, in my opinion, probably the easiest way to find out what springs you need. And it's something that took me several days before I found this. I was looking on forums and all kinds of stuff. So hop over here. Down on the bottom of the page, there's this Find My Spring database. There's a little tool here and you've got these five different tabs across the top that you can use to figure out what's what. And the easiest one here only needs four bits of information. It's the Find My Spring. So inside diameter, we know on ours it was two inches. Wire size, this one depends on, I know the new ones at least, we're gonna be 0.234, so I'm gonna use that. And length on these new ones was 35, if I'm not mistaken. And the door height on mine is eight feet. Then I hit go and look what pops up right here. I believe these are the exact torsion springs that I have, but uh, this gives me all the information I need, including the lift here. So I've got my wire, my length, my spring weight, how much each one weighs. I've got my cycles, this is important. So you wanna go for something with a higher cycle count because that's gonna matter as far as how much you actually can do. So the cycles on this one for 12 inch radius tracks is 33,000. The lift on this one is 103 pounds each. So these two springs together, in my case, are rated to lift 206 pounds, which is just over what I need, and it's about as close as I'm gonna get. That's fantastic, that's what I'm going with. Now you can see all of these ones are really similar in lift, 103, 102.4, 103.1. So all of these are other options, and some of these, you see we've got, I did the 33,000 cycles ones, you can get these ones here that aren't that much more that will go 77,000. And that's really the big difference between these springs is you wanna get ones that are rated for a higher cycle count, they're gonna last longer. And you see the price difference, I paid about 63 bucks for two of these, and with this one it's about 92 bucks. So $30 difference and you get quite a few, really double the life cycle out of it. So that's an option if you wanna go with that. The ones that came on mine were probably 12 to 18,000. 10,000 is the minimum you wanna look at, but the more you go, typically the better, at least to a certain point. I don't really need my springs to last 600 years, but I want them to last quite a while. The other reason I'm going with 33,000 on mine instead of higher is because I'm converting this into a shop, this garage, and I'm not going to be using the garage door very often. So keep in mind your usage. If you've got two cars, they're going in and out all day, every day, then you probably wanna get that higher cycle count. Now just to show you another option here, I can also go find by door weight. We know that our door weight was about 200 pounds. We'll punch in our height of eight feet, our track radius of 12 inches, and our inside diameter of two inches. We know we want two springs. And by the way, you can do this with one spring and most of the time that's not gonna be a good fit for most people. Usually it's gonna be two balanced springs, but they give you the option. And then I hit go and then I get this chart again. Now this is really close, 99.9 .9 for each spring as far as its lift capacity, 100.2. So these are almost spot on for what I need. But when I spoke with a technician at DDM, they suggested going with the ones I went with. It gives me a little leeway in there in case these get a little heavier with hardware or other facings that I put on there, anything like that. So it gives me a little room to breathe in there, which is good. Now that you've identified your torsion springs, hopefully you can order those and get those shipped to your house or maybe even pick them up locally. And that is a big check for that step. Next, we're gonna move on to the process of removing the old torsion springs. 
As we begin this step, this is where the rubber hits the road and let's make sure we're doing this safely. So first, put those safety glasses on if you haven't already done so. Second, we wanna disengage any form of power or connection to the garage door opener. So pull the plug on your garage door opener so there's no power getting to it at all. And then also disconnect your garage door from the carriage. Next, make sure you've got a sturdy ladder or step stool. Don't use a box or a bucket or a table or whatever you've got hanging around the garage. Use something that is meant for you to stand up on. I'm using a step ladder. It's got three steps and it gets me to exactly the right height. Find something like that. Lastly, with the safety precautions, I've mentioned this already once before, but I wanna re-emphasize, you just have to assume that some of these things are gonna break while you're working on them, because if you don't, then you're gonna put yourself in harm's way. So just act like something's gonna break at any time, particularly the spring that could come unwound, the winding cones that could fly really fast and have these little keys in them that could remove some flesh, and they have done so for people in the past. So just be super careful with all of that. That means keeping your head and your body out of the unwinding zone. So on this particular space right here, you need to be on one side or the other. Never put your head in the way of those winding bars going flying. It also means that you don't put your hands directly on the spring when it's got any tension on it, and that you're just being extra careful of all of those things so that you don't get pinched, grabbed, smacked, or whatever else might happen. Just play it safe. Now that we know we're being safe, we're gonna take a look at the new springs that have come from our shipment, and we're gonna notice a couple of things. These top parts here, these are called the keys that are on here. We're gonna be working quite a bit with those. Those are what fasten into the shaft. And then we're also noticing that there is some red painted on one of these and some black painted on the other. So the red one typically means that that's gonna go on the left side of the garage door. It means it's a right wind. And you can tell again by looking at, where is it here? The end right here of the spring. And if that one is going the same way as our right hand, just like this, I don't know how well you can see that, but this is a right wind. That means it's going on the left side. I know it's confusing, they're backwards, but that's how it goes. Um, same thing on our left wind here. This one goes on the right side and it's got black on top. So black to the right, red to the left. On your four inch drums on either side of the garage door, use a Sharpie to make a line. We're gonna just make an alignment mark here so that we can easily find this later. And I'm also gonna make a little line around it so it makes it easier to know exactly where this lines up to horizontally when we go to remount it. I have positioned myself right in the middle of the spring that currently has tension on it. The one on the right side here in my case is broken, so I'm underneath the left tension spring. Now I want to again stay clear of the unwinding path of the winding cone here. And I'm going to start by using one of my winding bars. Remember we've got these markers on here one inch up and that helps us to know that they're properly seated. So you should be listening for a nice thud like this. That's what we want. We want to thud bottom out inside the receiving area there. And then as soon as you put a little pressure on here, you should notice a couple of things. There should be a, quite a bit of tension on there from the spring. And then if you look on either side where the four inch drums are with the cable wrapped around, those should start to go slack as soon as you put some upward pressure on this. So that's what's happening in my scenario here. So once you've got that done, we're gonna grab the second bar. We're gonna lift this one up just to where we can put the second bar in. And again, thud it into place. And then we're gonna rest it against this metal bar on the top of the door right there. So now we relieve the pressure from the drums and the cables, and then we're holding this in place with this here. I'm being careful not to touch this at all. I'm gonna set my second winding bar up, grab my 3 8 inch open-ended wrench, and then I'll start to loosen the set screws or keys here. They shouldn't require a lot of effort. I'm just having to constantly remind myself to just be careful of body placement, hand placement, all of that. It's good. And then the next one for me, is kind of hidden over here. Now I'm specifically using open-ended wrenches here because that way if I use a socket set, it could kind of lock on there and if this does break free, it'll just smack over and over. Whereas these things will just come flying out and hopefully not be as likely to smack us. All right, so my two set screws are loose. I've got one here and one here. And at this point, I've got the entire tension of the spring resting on the bar. With my set screws loose, I can now begin the process of unwinding all of the tension out of this. So I'm going to lift just a little bit to get that bottom one out and I'm keeping pressure upwards towards the center of the winding cone. And I'm just gonna do this over and over. Release that one and let it go. And there's definitely tension starting to come out of this. Again, keeping everything clear of that path. I'm gonna grab the bottom one, down it goes, over and over. I'm gonna do this, it's usually, in my case, gonna be about 34 turns, quarter turns here, until I have the pressure relieved completely from it. I just saw the shaft spin a little bit too, and that can happen and that's okay. Yep, there it goes. Every time I'm making sure that the winding bar is completely seated into the winding cone. 
I'm also making sure to keep my hands totally clear from the winding cone. Those little set screws can be vicious. And I'm also keeping my body and my head out of the line of unwinding. It's getting shorter. You can see right here, there's the indents from the set screws before. And I'll show you how to take care of those in just a minute. I also noticed that there's less pressure than there was before, which is great. Okay, now it got to the point where there's no pressure on this at all and it won't hold in place. That means this thing is unwound and the tension is relieved. Now we're gonna remove the torsion hardware from the center and these are both mounted to the bracket in the center here. There's just two bolts, nuts and bolts here to remove. I'm gonna use my drill, my impact driver, which I love, and then just one socket on the end here, one wrench. Make sure it's in reverse. Uh, there we go. Make sure this is in reverse and then I'll secure it on the right side. Get that out. I'm gonna put these on the top of the garage door so we don't lose them. And then the same thing on the bottom set. Okay, there we go. Get rid of that one. And then our other bolts as well. Now on one side or the other, you're gonna have a bushing. There's the bushing there that's only gonna be on one side. And this is what's called an open mouth bracket here. So I'm gonna use a pair of vice grips, clamp this down, there we go, that this can't slide off while we do the rest of the job. With our center hardware removed, and then with the set screws removed or loosened on the torsion one, on the tension spring that's not broken, we're now gonna move over to the broken spring and release the tension from the set screws on that, then we can slide each one off. In order to take our springs off, we need to remove the drum on the end, and this uses that same 3 8 set screw here. So we're gonna loosen those up, go. We get the other one. There we go, okay. Then we also wanna take out our cable. And this has an end on it that holds it in place. So I'm gonna take this off and I'm just gonna slide it into some of the hardware on the garage door so that doesn't get lost or go free somewhere. Now with our set screws loose, we should be able to pull this down a little bit. It might be a little stubborn, which this one is. I'm gonna loosen these as much as I need to here. Give that plenty of play, there we go. Now it's moving freely out of the way. And here we're gonna use our file again and just take care of any rough spots right here where those set screws were digging into the shaft. Now I'll go do the same thing on the other side and then I'll find my way back here in just a second. In order to remove the set screws on this one, which is completely untensioned, I'm just gonna use a 7 16 multi-point socket. This is one that's a little bit different. It's actually meant for all different types of heads. And so it fits on there just perfectly. And you can usually use anything that's a multi-point socket, anything like that. Again, gonna have this in reverse, seated on there properly. Okay, out goes that one. Then we can just turn it and loosen that one. Now, this should be able to slide off. And what I'm gonna do is take care right now of the bar here, because I wanna use a file and make sure that there's no burrs or anything. Just making sure this is smooth all the way around and we're good. And that makes it so that when we put the new one, it should be able to slide in place pretty easily. And I'll just slide this off towards the end of the bar. And we'll do the same thing with the left side. Now with both sides loosened, we can push this one out this direction. There we go. Slide off the drum. We can place that right over here for safekeeping. And then slide off our old spring. Excellent. For now, I'm gonna slide this back in. As we transition the old spring off, we can now put the new spring on. And this is transitioning from step two, which is to remove the old spring and old torsion hardware to step three, which is to put the new stuff on. So I've got the next one lying right here. Got to remember to put the winding cone on the left side and I'm just gonna pop this back out, feed it back in like this. And then sometimes the tricky part will be getting it through the hole on the end there, but hopefully this one will go fairly smooth. Let's see. It would help if I undid the set screws first. I forgot to do that. Make sure you loosen those all the way before this next step. Not like what I just did. That was my mistake. I forgot to do that beforehand. So I'm just feeling inside here to where they're past the opening and they are now. Okay. Now that the spring is on, I can put the drum back on. I'm gonna make sure to put it with the set screws facing in, like so. Now with the drum back on, I'm gonna leave everything loose so that I can now go do the same thing over on the right side. Now with the opposite side loose, I can slide this whole thing out like that. Take off the drum, 
store it right here for a moment while I take off the spring. Okay, now I'm gonna put on the new spring, making sure to loosen up my set screws first. Be careful not to pinch your fingers here. Slide that over, drum back on with the set screws facing in, and then put it back through the mounting bracket, right there. Now with our second one, we can begin to tighten everything down right now. And I'm gonna line up the marks that I made before, right there. And that allows us to not have to put new indents in the shaft here, tighten these down by hand. I'm just gonna go until I feel them make contact. As soon as I start to get some resistance here, I'm gonna pause and then do the other one. Okay, I've got some resistance there. At this point, I'm gonna do about a half turn on each one, one at a time, obviously. Okay, there's that one and about a half turn there. Now I'm gonna go back and just do a quarter turn, if that, maybe it's more of an eighth really. <sighs> there we go. So that's in there nice and snug. It's just using those same indents that were on there before and we should be all set. Now I'm going to slide this one, our spring, over towards the middle, making sure not to let the bar slide off. Okay, now I'll go do the same on the left side. I almost forgot while I'm up here, we need to put the cable back in and it's gonna go around the back side, find the opening which in my case is currently on top here. Slide it in, make sure it lines up in that first groove. There we go. Same thing over here, we're gonna line up our drum. Okay, right there. This is also a great spot to use that same 7 16 multi-center or multi-point socket if you want to. Tighten everything up in place here. Just makes it a little bit quicker. There we go. I'm trying to do it equally on both set screws and then I'll just do a little more on each one once and we're good. I'm gonna slide my spring back towards the center. And with both the drums in place, then the bar is captive and it's not gonna be able to slide off anymore. Put my cable back in place, right in here like so, and then wind it up along its track. And then, yep, as I do this, we're putting tension on both sides, which is great. One thing that's gonna help a lot with these cables, you need to make sure they're both tensioned at the same time and make sure this one's in place. I'm looking down to make sure my other one's in place as well. And then I'm gonna provide some resistance and then use vice grips to hold that resistance in place. I'm gonna use the header of the garage door. There we go. So now it can't go anywhere. And I've got the proper resistance on both of these. As I apply tension to the torsion springs, these aren't gonna be getting off track or sliding out of their slots at all. While I'm over here, I'm also gonna get a measurement of how far away from my two by six here the shaft is. So in my case, it's about three and a half inches and from the wall, it's about four and a half. So I'm gonna use that measurement to align it on the center where the center mount is. Now that we have our cones in place, we're ready to fasten the hardware in the center again. I'm gonna to check to get my shaft right at the three and a half inches away. So that's the same distance that it was on the outer edges. So I'll release this here and bring this out a little to about there probably. Yep, and there's my three and a half. Okay, so I'm good there. I'm gonna use the bushing to bring this whole thing over, set it on the bushing. I'm gonna rotate this to where the holes for the mounting hardware line up with the slots here. Yeah, and I'm gonna have to lift it to get it there, which is fine. Okay, and I've got all my hardware right here. Start by attaching the first piece in place and through there. We're just gonna start hand tight on these. And for this, we're gonna have to lift everything up a smidge. And once again, I'll get my measurement since I'm, in my case, it's gonna be pretty close to the edge. Hand tighten. And I just realized I should be using power tools here because I've got them. Ends that up really well. So I'm also just gonna check right here that our bolts that go into the header are nice and secure and everything looks fine there. These are great. We wanna make sure that there's nothing loose anywhere on any of this as far as the hardware is concerned, and I think we're in good shape. Now, this is completely optional, but if you don't have writing on your springs themselves, sometimes it's helpful to take some chalk like this and then just chalk mark a line across there. That's gonna help for counting your turns later on. There we go. So I've got those on there, and I've already got lines on here, so that's extra, but just something to keep in mind if you don't have lines already on your springs. Now we get to wind these things up. This is the fun part because this is what makes these work again. But just like everything else, we're gonna have to exercise all the precautions that we talked about before. Now to get started, before we actually wind anything, I'm going to mark 
on the shaft here, exactly where that interfaces with the winding cone. And we're doing this just to make sure that that gets covered up. If these are on in the right direction, then as this gets tightened up, it will move down the shaft and cover up that line. I'll do the same thing on the other side when I get to it. And then I'll show you how we can use that to actually stretch the springs a little bit to make it a little safer, just in case they're over tightened or under tightened. Now, with that ready to go, we've got our winding bars up here. I'm making sure to stay clear and we're just gonna start winding. I'm gonna hand tighten this, see where it gets to right about there. There. Okay, I think I can get this first one started right here. So we're gonna do this depending on the size of your garage door, either 30 or 34 times. So if you have a seven foot door, 30 times is your count. I've got an eight foot door, so that's gonna be 34. So I've gotta have both of my winding bars ready. I'm steering clear of their path. I've got it locked all the way in right up to the marker here. And put my second one in, that's one. Two. Three, making sure to seat it properly every time and use this as my guide. Don't be too quick about this. We wanna be super careful. And then in my case, there's five. I'm gonna go up to 34. Six, seven, eight. Now I'll pause right here just so you can see it's actually past the line that I drew. So we know we're going in the right direction. If you've got these backwards, then you're gonna notice that it will actually, the winding cone will come off after about six turns. So that's something to watch out for. Seven, eight. 34. So that's 34 and I'm fortunate that the set screws are actually facing me. That'll make it a little bit easier. I'm now gonna take my marker. This is under tension, so I'm gonna try not to touch as, as little as I can basically. I'll touch as little as I can. It's gonna make a line about a quarter inch away from where it is now and I'm gonna spread the springs just a little. This will make it so that they don't bind up if they're at their max torsion or tension and it's recommended just as a safety precaution to do this and it's pretty easy to do fortunately as well. I'm gonna lift it up like this then with my right hand push it over that way. There we go. So I'm over to my line now. This is well seated and I'm ready to tighten down my set screws. So I'm gonna finger tighten them first, just like that, and they don't have much to go, so that's good. Okay, I'm gonna go until they feel snug against the bar. Right there, that should be good. Now, here's the part where we wanna be super careful. I'm gonna remove the winding bar because my set screw should be holding everything. I'm gonna grab my second winding bar, seat it, and lift. Pull out the bottom one. And now it's gonna start putting tension on my cables. I'm just double checking the drums to make sure the cables are lined up properly on the drums, and they are. Okay, so that's holding. I'm gonna do that very carefully. You don't want anything to spin loose if it wasn't tightened down properly. At this point, I can remove the vice grips that I put on earlier and then move over to the other side. Now that we've got the vice grips off the top bar, we're actually gonna relocate them before we do our second spring, about three inches above one of the rollers here. Just like that. What this does is this makes it so that if we over tighten the springs, then it's not gonna go past a few inches here. This will hopefully help stop it. In fact, I'm gonna tighten that down just a little bit more to make sure it's strong. There we go. Same as before on our other side, we're gonna go 34 turns very carefully, making sure to stay clear. Same thing on this side, we're gonna start by marking on the bar just to make sure we're moving in the right direction. The fact that we moved in the right direction on that one means this one pretty much has to, but we'll just do that to be safe. And then we're gonna do our 34 turns on this as well. So there's one. Three. I'm just counting these every time it clicks the drum here at the top of the garage door. Four. Six, seven, eight, 34. All right, so I should be way past my line, but I'm gonna go ahead and stretch this out that quarter inch again. Go right up to there. And just like before, we're gonna lift with one hand and tap with the other. Okay, that one doesn't wanna move much more than that, so that's about all we're gonna get. I'll take what I can get on this one. There we go. Now, while that bar is holding it in place, I'll fasten down my set screws. All right, now for the moment of truth. Our springs are tensioned and we're ready to lift the door and check to see if it's balanced. I should be able to lift this by myself. Easy peasy. Now what we're looking for is we wanna lift this about halfway like this and make sure it stays in place. And then it should be able to lift pretty easily as it goes the rest of the way up. Yeah, that's doing good. Okay. So that moves really nice and easy. Sorry, the picture's probably blown out right now. And then I should also be able to pull it down without a ton of resistance.
So I am, in fact, going to take one more quarter turn. And like I mentioned before, that's the most I want to do. That'll be a half turn total that I'm removing from this. But I'm kind of future proofing this a little bit since I've got springs that are rated for a few pounds more than my door. That way, if I want to paint this or put another coat of something to kind of cover all the purple up here, then I have that option to do that. That'll add a few more pounds, but then I can up the tension on this just another quarter turn, for example, to compensate for that. Now, because this appears to be a little bit too tight in my case, we can test this out. What we're looking for is the movement of the garage door when it's on its own. So as I lift this up, I can release the tension there. Like I mentioned, it looks like this one might be a little bit too tight, actually, these two springs. So we're gonna test that just to make sure. We're gonna do this very carefully. That's why we have those vice grips down there to prevent it from going up too much. But I'm gonna remove the bottom spring. And as I let go, yeah, it's starting to pull up here. So it'll hold, but it's wanting to pull up a little bit, which means we probably have about a quarter turn too much. So I'm gonna put this one back down, lock our winding bar into place right there. I'm gonna remove these and then release it about a quarter turn, tighten them back up. I'm gonna do the same thing on both sides equally. All right, again, I'm exercising the utmost caution here. The last thing I wanna do is get sloppy while I'm making these final adjustments here. Insert this guy, lift up. I'm gonna let it go down one quarter. There we go. I'll tighten these back down. And even here, I'm just kind of really scared, kind of cautious about these things spinning. If this thing comes loose, these things will rip my fingers off. So definitely want to be careful here. There we go, a good grip and good. Okay, so that's our quarter turn on this one. We should notice a little bit of a difference right away at least. I'm gonna pull that bottom one out and let go, yeah. So it's still wanting to lift a little, but hardly. I think we're in a good spot there. I'm gonna move over to the next one. Now, a word of caution on this, if you have to do more than a half turn, so a quarter plus another quarter, then that means you've got the wrong springs on there and you're gonna need to get different springs. If you have to go to that three quarter mark, that's probably too much. A quarter to a half turn is about all you should be adjusting these. Okay, same deal here. I'm gonna relieve that quarter turn, just like that. All right, that feels good right there. And just like before, we're gonna very carefully release this, testing it by feel all along the way. Okay, good. We had almost no movement on the door. So now we're gonna lift this up by pulling on the door this way. Okay, it's staying in place. It's not trying to come back up on us, so that's a good thing. I'm gonna go up here now. Okay, and that's stopping at the vice grips that I put in earlier, so that's a good thing. But as I put it back on the ground, it stays on the ground. Okay, so I think we should be good there. I'm gonna remove the vice grips and we're gonna test this out to check for balance on the door. No movement on the door. Okay, I think that's where we needed it. I think we're in good shape now. This is your friend, this or something similar to this. This is specifically a lubricant made for working with garage doors. And you can see on here, it's actually rated for pretty much all of the parts. It says garage door chain, screw drives, pivot points, hinges, pulleys, latches, locks, cables, springs, bearings, bushings, door tracks and chains. So this really covers everything that we need here. This is not WD-40. This is something that's meant specifically for garage doors. And I love these cans that they have both, kind of like the WD-40 cans, the regular general spray, or you can pop this out and get the more specific version right there. So we're gonna lube basically all the moving parts on the garage door right now. But the one that's kind of interesting is we're gonna start up here on the springs. I'm gonna use the wider spray on this and I'm not gonna spray the last inch or the inside inch. I'm just gonna get everything but that, those outside inches. Not only that, but we're gonna actually just rub this all in here. And you can put a little more on. Okay, we're gonna rub this all around here. And again, we're leaving that last inch alone, but this will help seal and protect the spring and give it a little bit longer life. We'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, same thing over here. And while we're up here, I'm gonna spray right inside where we have movement in there. It's okay if I let it drip a little, I don't wanna overdo it, but I'd rather get that nice and lubed up. Um, we might as well hit this right here. Anything that's moving, any of these moving parts here, we wanna take care of those as best we can. Now I'm gonna go down to the ends and hit the ends where we've got the pulleys with the drums. So I'm now hitting this back side where all the movement takes place. I don't wanna hit it in here, that's not the ideal spot, but now I can also get our wheels and any moving parts like our hinges here. I've actually done this on this door not that long ago, so that should be in decent shape. And then lastly, I'll hit the bearings on the outside of this drum. 
And then with that, we should be in good shape. Now with our garage door opener plugged in, and then we've got our track that should be about re-engaged here, we're gonna hit the button and see how it turns out. Ah ha ha, there we go. Springs are working just as they should. The balance looks great. And because we've lubricated everything, it sounds so much better. This is nice and quiet. And I've got a lot of extra weight with all these panels on here, but it handles it beautifully. Let's make sure it closes just fine as well. Here it comes, looking good. All right, so awesome. We've got a whole playlist of videos for your garage, everything from organization to overhead storage, you name it. I've got a whole bunch of stuff taken care of in this playlist right here. So you may wanna check that out. And remember, links to everything I've talked about, including all of the tools, the merch that I'm wearing, all that kind of stuff, you can find that all in the description below. I'm Nils with Learn to DIY. Thanks for watching.